我呢個係一年，一年，我都係呢、這個，哦，係喎，係喎，係喎，你兩位，我哋係 friends， 唔係 friends， 係呢個，係So I'll be looking at this. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, on this very lovely sunny day, let us uh, welcome all of you to the fifth policy dialogue series, 2022-23, co-organized by the Division of Public Policy, Department of Asian and Policy Studies, and the Academy of Hong Kong Studies uh, Education University. So this is the fifth uh, policy dialogue that we have. And this will be the last one this uh, academic year. The title is a very timely policy and educational subject. Education and science, does STEM education matter in Hong Kong's move into an innovation and technology hub? Uh, I'm Peter Chen. I'm the head of department of the Department of Social Science and Education University. And let me very briefly uh, introduce our distinguished speakers today. Okay. First of all, as you know, we have Professor Anthony Zhang. Uh, Professor Anthony Zhang is a advisor at Education University and an adjunct professor at Hong Kong UST. Uh, he was the former president of Hong Kong uh, Institute of Education, uh, later, of course, uh, retired into the Hong Kong Education, Education University of Hong Kong, and also the former secretary for transport and housing. He has worked in various uh, institutions before and also serve in legislative council and other public bodies. Okay. Then we have Professor Lloyd Dialog, uh, a prominent sociologist and chair professor of Hong Kong studies and director of Academy of Hong Kong studies at, at U Hong Kong. We also have Professor Nabuha Sharif, uh, well-known expert on innovation and technology policy uh, and currently acting head of the Division of Public Policy at Hong Kong UST. So given the prominence of innovation and technology and the need to upgrade our education, so this is a very timely topic and timely occasion for us to explore this subject. First of all, may I invite Professor Anthony Jones to make his remarks. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for the introduction. Uh, today's topic, uh, as, you, as you point out, is very timely, education and science. And um, of course, uh, in terms of education, science education uh, is not uh, a new thing. Of course, increasingly we are talking about STEM uh, uh, in Hong Kong and elsewhere. Uh, innovation and technology has become a catchword. But let me stop by um, uh, talking about uh, science education. And as I prepared the presentation uh, this morning, I happened to come across uh, uh, an inf the, the information about an event that uh, the former Institute of Education 
the, the predecessor of uh, the present uh, education university, uh, organized uh, more than 10 years ago in 2010. And that was the uh, first global Chinese conference on science education. So uh, the education university, then the Hong Kong Institute of Education was uh, a main organizer, and then there were uh, universities on the mainland. And the issues explored at that conference, which I think uh, are still relevant today because they relate both to uh, science education at the school level and also what, what the objective of science education should be in, 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 the, greater sen in the larger sense. So here I've uh, extracted um, four of the objectives of that conference, cultivating students' curiosity about the world, understanding of nature, enhanced scientific thinking in daily life. So very much to do with uh, daily living, knowledge and evidence-based problem-solving skills, assuming that science could enhance that kind of uh, problem-solving. And then, uh, of course, it all starts from uh, the time when you're students. So the great scientists, they all uh, started as students, so grooming the next generation of scientists and integrating science and other disciplines and domains in the learning process. I think these are not unfamiliar to uh, most of us. Now, science education, the importance of science in national policy, again, is not new. Now here I um, quote two persons, they all, they've all passed away, Richard Nixon, what he said in September 1960. At that time, I think he was the vice president under uh, Eisenhower, and in fact, he campaigned for, he, he, he ran for presidency the US presidency in 1960, and he lost to uh, JF Kennedy. But he said at that time that we are, the US, are in the midst of the most explosive scientific revolution the world has ever seen. Everybody at that time was talking about uh, scientific revolution. After the Second World War, science seemed to be so promising to the big nations. And uh, he said, our nation demands a strong science and a vigorous technology to defend itself. So very much to do with um, national uh, uh, security, national defense. Another person, uh, uh, Harold Wilson, he was, for, he was later the prime minister of uh, the UK and actually became uh, prime minister first time in 1964. So what he said, which I quote here, in September 1963 was when he was the leader of the opposition. The Labour Party at the time was in opposition. And he said, a new Britain would need to be forged in the white heat of a science revolution. So a science, scientific revolution. So a scientific revolution could bring about a new nation, Britain in a new form. And at that time, I was a teenager. And I remem remember vividly what, uh, the, the, all the talk about a scientific revolution. And that has not basically changed up to now, because at the turn of this century, the 21st century, every nation, big and small, is talking about innovation and technology, and even Hong Kong as a special administrative region. So we are talking about innovation and technology revolution. Now let's look at what the US is talking about today. And here I quote from the website of the US Department of State uh, website, and it said, it says, science, technology, and innovation are cornerstones of the American economy. And the importance of science and technology and innovation is extended uh, to the importance of strengthening, uh, of fostering open, transparent, and meritocratic systems of governance throughout the world. Now, personally, I don't know how how it could be so uh, essential to, for example, uh, meritocratic systems of governance, because that depends not just on science and technology, but on many things, many institutional arrangements. For our own nation, for China, President Xi Jinping said in 2016, and in English, what he said was, if science and technology prosper, 
the nation will prosper. And if science and technology are strong, the country will be strong. So that sets the scene for why uh, science and education, science in education is so important and why innovation and technology forms very much part of that uh, a larger picture. Okay, next slide. Oh, sorry. Right, now we have, the world has entered what is known as the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, uh, this few months, everybody is talking about uh, chat GPT, AI, how that will transform uh, daily life, uh, business, academia. And then of course, the question which sometimes is not asked is how that would affect the human beings. Where does the human community stand in, in this uh, change? But the, the, uh, the pace of change or scientific scientific revolution, innovation, the technology revolution is very much uh, 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 part of the ongoing scene. And its impact, not just on technology, but also on governance, on everyday life, is well recognized. So how, how have uh, ourselves been prepared for that kind of rapid change? Now, because we are talking about uh, science and education, so let's look at school education. Now, uh, this slide shows the result of PISA uh, 2018, the OECD assessment of uh, student performance, mainly in reading, mathematics, and uh, science. And Hong Kong has always been uh, at the top of the list, not the first place, but among the first few places. And we have been doing very well. Uh, this is, uh, uh, the slide shows the results in PISA 2018, because uh, PISA 2021 was postponed to PISA 2022, and the results haven't been uh, out yet. Um, but if you look at the 2018 results, uh, we are fourth in reading, fourth in mathematics, but ninth in science. So in a way, science um, is lagging behind. And uh, so I think it makes sense that uh, Hong Kong should do more in terms of science education, in terms of what is now uh, uh, defined as STEM education, particularly in, uh, because of the rapid um, advancement in uh, the digital economy. So we need a population of young people to be more uh, digital literate. But my question is, uh, if we think that science education should help uh, to enhance um, problem-solving skills, so in what sense can the kind of STEM education that we are delivering achieve that? And you don't solve problems out of, no, out of nowhere, because you, we are talking about the world, about the future. So what about the critical mind and uh, uh, the level of creativity? that we should be inculcating among our students and to what extent science education, STEM education and the integration of science and other subjects help to achieve that. And uh, the world is becoming globalized. So how can education help students to have a global outlook? Now, all these are all equally important and we must not uh, for forget them uh, as we uh, take STEM education forward. In a way, Hong Kong is the latecomer in STEM education because officially the government uh, uh, launched the policy in 2015. Of course, science education has always been around, but in terms of STEM education, the official policy was launched in uh, 2015. But since then, there has been much emphasis on the importance of STEM, whether in in terms of curriculum, in terms of teaching and learning, in terms of uh, even uh, organizing extracurricular activities, uh, internships and all that. 
And uh, here I'm quoting some of the uh, activities or directions uh, from the government's uh, uh, official uh, uh, articulation. STEM, or now STEAM education, A, representing the arts, has been integrating into the learning and teaching of the existing curriculum instead of being treated as an extracurricular activity. So the purpose is to enhance IT uh, or information in literacy problem solving skills relating to uh, STEM and critical thinking. And each school has its STEM coordinator and sometimes a task force, a task group uh, to help coordinate activities to, to promote uh, STEM. So um, we can say that uh, STEM is now very much everywhere at, at the school level. But then we have to recognize that the world, IT, information and technology has been advancing very, very rapidly. Now, according to uh, a report uh, done by McKinsey a few years ago, I think it was around 2017 or 2016, it's discovered at that time that 65% of children entering school will work in a job that hasn't, that hasn't been invented yet. In other words, whatever you teach the students in school, that what their future job will be quite different, quite strange to them. Nearly half, 49% of the current jobs have the potential for machine replacement, with 60% having at least one third of the activities automated. The machine automation uh, is a trend. 80% of the skills trained for in the last uh, half decade, a half century, can now be outperformed by machines. So the implications are school learning and curriculum uh, are soon becoming redundant at every stage uh, of the world today. So what is important is not just the specific skills and techniques or even knowledge. What is more important is how to nurture a critical mind and the capacity to adapt among our younger generation. The capacity to, to learn, to learn, learning to learn, which was again a catchword uh, just a decade ago. Hong Kong's universities have been ranking, uh, are ranked very highly uh, according to various um, indicators. We are the top uh, 100 or a few universities are among the top 50 according to the Times Higher Education or the QS rankings. Our research uh, according to the UGC's uh, research assessment exercise 2020, 25% uh, 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 were classified by international experts as uh, world leading and 45% internationally excellent. So we are doing very well in terms of basic research. However, in terms of, uh, here I'm quoting the world's universities with the world impact assessment. Uh, according to that uh, ranking, among, in terms of uh, innovative uh, impact, actually, uh, a few years, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, in 2019 here, according to the slide here, we don't have any Hong Kong University being in the top 100. And then more lately in 2022, only one got into the, the top 200, uh, 100, and that was uh, HKUST. So we just wonder if we have world-class universities in Hong Kong all along, why have these universities not been ranked as innovative among the top 100 uh, innovative uh, universities. Uh, UST has led uh, a special public policy research project, which both uh, Nabaha and, and myself, we, we took part in that project. And the project was finished last year uh, in late 2022. The, the, the objective of the project was to see how Hong Kong universities can perform better in helping Hong Kong to become an information, uh, an innovation and technology hub. And we, we found that in a way, Hong Kong was lacking behind other hub cities. 
hub meaning information uh, innovation and technology hub. So we we asked a few questions compared to research universities active in uh, R and D and KT KT meaning knowledge transfer in hubs elsewhere. Why have Hong Kong's universities not been able to deliver better results, despite several of them ranking among the world's top 50 and excellent and excelling in uh, basic research? Should public research universities in Hong Kong take up uh, a greater role, a pioneer or driving role in accelerating the development of a global INT hub in Hong Kong within the context of the GBA, the Greater Bay Area? Now, the answer seems to be quite obvious. Of course, we should. But if so, how? And then we identified a few areas that attention should be paid to. First, university-specific improvements, whether within the university system there are sufficient incentives, uh, support measures. B, government policy directions. If the government is so uh, cares about uh, innovation and technology that much, how could that be translated into specific uh, policy directions, particularly directions for education and higher education in Hong Kong? And C, reshaping and restructuring the ecosystem. Uh, the importance of the ecosystem for in innovation and technology is also spelled out in the most recent blueprint, the innovation and technology blueprint produced by the government in December last year. So it's a bit of everything. So you just, if you just hope that the universities uh, can do the job, that's definitely not enough. We need stronger government presence, government uh, direction, a stronger collaboration regime among, between government, uh, uh, industry, and universities. And we have to um, bear in mind the collective nature of innovation because innovation uh, can fail. Innovation carries risk. So the pooling of risk requires some kind of collective efforts. And uh, among those efforts, the government's role is very important. So within, without government, without major private sector initiatives, industry initiatives, just relying on university research is not sufficient. Now, here I'm quoting uh, uh, some points the, the directions, the four broad directions, and eight major strategies from the INT development blueprint. I'm not going into detail here, but just to show that the government now indeed has set the directions and uh, some major strategies. Among those strategies, strategy five, to enrich INT talent resources and develop an international talent hub. And more specifically, there are two targets in relation to this. Target one, to step up nurturing of, no, of local IT talent at different learning stages. As in school, promoting STEM education, providing STEM internship. And interesting enough, the target uh, for the next five years, the government's target, is that 35% of UGC funded students, public universities, will be studying STEM or STEAM related subjects. It's a very ambitious. Um, uh, target. And apart from nurturing local talent, retaining local INT talent, target uh, two, to proactively attract mainland and overseas INT uh, talent. Now, the details are quite familiar to many of us, so I'm not uh, talking about them here. Just to let us know that we are now very much in action. But ultimately, I think it's not just uh, uh, about programs, uh, measures, initiatives that we are launching. Ultimately, it's about the e ecosystem, about what the kind of capacity we are able to uh, build, to develop. And here, I'm in, according to this slide, I'm quoting Kenichi Ome, uh, the management guru. And in a book published in the 1910, I think, it, sorry, 2000 and uh, in the 2000s, 2007, the, uh, the Chinese translation was published in 2007 on uh, dictating the capacity to adapt, the capacity to, to be in action immediately. He talked about the importance of language, 
finance, managing finance, not just the figures, but the, the sense of using assets, and also problem solving skills, including strategy. So he said, uh, you have to inculcate uh, critical thinking and strong adaptability so that you, you put the person anywhere that person can perform, can adapt to the situation, can be creative enough to think out of the box, to go beyond boundaries and orthodoxies to generate solutions. And he, try, he tried to explain why Japan failed uh, uh, since the 1990s, because of the lack of that kind of capacity, because of the ecosystem not conducive to grooming innovation, to adapting uh, rapid changes in the world, including uh, 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 ICT, including uh, globalization. But the world is fast changing, so we must not uh, equate STEM education, STEM uh, curriculum, or even smart city as um, uh, having sufficient capacity to adapt and be creative. And now that uh, everybody is talking about AI, ChatGPT, so I just wonder where the human is. The human mind still important, and I think it's very important. And uh, Ome also regarded that as very important. So the capacity to think, adapt, reflect, we in, we in, uh, in invigorate, I think these are very essential qualities to uh, foster the kind of uh, uh, adaptation, the Newton spirit, if you like, uh, the right questions to ask. Now, so back to basics, because we are not just talking about science, we are also talking about education. In educa education, is not just science. So back to basics, are we educating properly? And many uh, educationalists have been asking uh, this question. And I remember more than 10 years ago, uh, the former vice chancellor of Macquarie University in Australia, he wondered whether universities those days have become so focused on imparting knowledge that they have forgotten to impart wisdom. The word what should be deleted, impart wisdom. Are we imparting wisdom and some pessimists like uh, Bill Reddings, he wondered whether universities are now in ruins. They have lost the sense of mission, the, 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 ori the, the, the original uh, mission of uh, a university. Now, I'm not casting any judgment here. I'm simply saying that people are also reflecting on the direction of education, uh, of um, uh, whether at the university level or school level, whether we are pursuing excellence without a soul. So what is a soul in education? The wisdom, the sense of wisdom, the sense of values, the sense of humanity. Uh, quite often, we have, uh, there, there is this uh, false dichotomy between science and the arts, as if they are exclusive. But if we trace the origin, for example, of liberal arts education since uh, uh, many uh, centuries ago, Actually, the origin of liberal arts was to cover nature, understanding nature, science in those days. So the ideal of education should be uh, the capacity to uh, understand nature, the human mind, the human, uh, human society, humanhood. So it's of a high order than just the skills or the, the knowledge. But today, science is too separated from the arts. So can we bring about a more integrated kind of education at different levels, more multidisciplinary and multicultural? So finally, to end my presentation, uh, the world has changed, it's changing very rapidly, but in a way, the world has not changed because the problems that we face in the world has not changed. Conflicts, misunderstandings, risks, Panic, hostilities, hunger, violence, prejudice, discrimination, insecurity. These are perennial problems. So what is education going to do about it? If we say that STEM is so important, innovation and technology is so important, what are they going to do about these problems? Now, uh, just to end, I am quoting Nelson Mandela. Mandela once said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. But he also said, one of the most important things is not to change society, 
but to change yourself. Can education achieve that purpose? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anthony, for giving us a very comprehensive, uh, yet critical and engaging reflection on all these core issues. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Nabuha Sharif. So please share with us. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. I was very inspired by Anthony's comments. It's a tough task to follow on from Anthony as always, but I will do my best. So the, the topic for today is the STEM education matter in Hong Kong's move to become an innovation and technology hub. In a nutshell, I think it's possible to answer that with an unequivocal yes. But there are two broader points to be taken on board as we look at this question, does STEM education matter? First, it is not just STEM education. As Anthony pointed out towards the end of his presentation, um, there's a false dichotomy between STEM, uh, for, between the sciences and the arts, which has to be bridged. So we have to acknowledge that it, education is important to the extent that all education, including the arts education, as far as it bridges the science and technological facets, is also important. And the second facet, uh, second aspect to note, is that in creating an innovation and technology hub, Anthony mentioned this word of ecosystem, that's an important point to remember because in creating an innovation and technology hub, it is not just one building block that is required. There are multiple building blocks and education is indeed a very important building block. However, no matter how important even education is, it is just one block. There are other blocks to creating that innovation ecosystem which is why this, this word that Anthony used of ecosystem must be remembered, because I believe that education unequivocally, STEM education unequivocally is important. However, it has to be aligned with the other building blocks, the other ingredients to make uh, a, a, success, a successful outcome of an innovation and technology hub. A bit like a flavorful dish, one single ingredient, no matter how super strengthy uh, that ingredient is, is insufficient to make a flavorful dish. It requires multiple ingredients. They all have to interact with one another. And then at the end of the process of cooking and creating the dish, you arrive at a successful meal, similarly for an innovation and technology hub. Okay, with those um, introductory remarks, I will just move on to the, to the nuts and bolts of my presentation. Um, I have some uh, introductory points that I would like to raise, followed by a closer look at Hong Kong. So as Anthony mentioned, there's been an emerging global interest in STEM education um, as a way to meet emerging global challenges. And STEM education has now been in the spotlight for several decades. That goes without edu uh, question. STEM education is also uh, related more recently to the need to maintain economic competitiveness, scientific and technological competitiveness, as more and more economies globally try to focus on the uh, pursuit of innovation and technology, it has become increasingly clear that one important ingredient is education, and within education, it is science, technology, engineering, and mathematical education. And this is a more recent change. Joel Moker, in one of his books uh, written in 1990, uh, titled it, Technology as the Lever of Riches, meaning that technology can be used as a key to open this door where vast riches can be found, meaning that innovation and technology can lead to the pursuit, uh, the successful pursuit of economic growth, economic competitiveness, and scientific and technological competitiveness. With that recognition, more and more economies are now trying to figure out how to find the key to open that door to, to all these riches. And as they try to figure out what ingredients are required, education and STEM education in particular has become an important um, uh, player. There's also been a declining interest in some countries in STEM education that has been mourned by some uh, policymakers, um, uh, particularly Western countries, and um, a, com a concomitant interest in developing emerging economies in STEM education. Now, once again, I'm not uh, placing or, or trying to impart any judgment on whether this is right or wrong, because as Anthony correctly mentioned, there is this um, false dichotomy between the arts and sciences that needs to be bridged. So just because declining interest in STEM in some countries and rising interest in STEM in other countries is a, is a trend that we see, 
doesn't necessarily mean and equate to those countries that are pursuing STEM with more vigor being able to uh, pursue economic growth through innovation and technology. There are some challenges related to STEM education that I'd like to point out. Um, and one of those is that it, this is one concept. It's become a catchword, uh, a keyword, a buzzword, STEM or even STEAM. I'll talk about STEAM in a, in a, in a while. But uh, they are, in fact, disconnected and um, independent subjects. What does STEM stand for? It stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So this, this acronym itself has come under some criticism because some people say, well, technology and engineering is actually quite similar. Um, how about the arts, which is why we now see the um, acronym being changed from STEM to STEAM. There's also another challenge in so far as STEM courses tend to be taught in silos. Once again, there's an insufficient connection made between science, technology, engineering, and mathematics to the arts. How does it make you a better person? How does it help humanity? How does it help society? We learn a lot about the nuts and bolts of STEM, but not perhaps not so much in terms of how STEM can help us as individuals grow, our families, our communities, our societies become better places to live. Also, in, as far as STEM is concerned, uh, we have seen an increasing emphasis on rote learning over situated learning. And this is one of the criticisms of STEM is, is that those countries that do really well on these PISA, PISA tests that uh, Anthony uh, began his presentation with uh, may just be a reflection of those countries' ability to rote learn and memorize better than other countries who do not perform as well on the PISA tests. So this is another challenge related to STEM education that we've been seeing over the years that um, with the pursuit and the increased emphasis on STEM, sometimes that has equated to simple and mere rote learning over situated learning. How does science, technology, engineering fit into a broader societal, global context? And finally, the challenge related to STEM education is there's little consensus on how STEM should be taught. Should it be taught in silos? Should it be taught as integrated subjects, the four subjects of STEM, should they be all taught together? Should STEM be taught within a societal and cultural framework? And there's little consensus on this as well. So Anthony mentioned uh, correctly uh, that Hong Kong has been um, teaching science, technology, engineering, and medicine uh, for, for many, many decades, but there has been a renewed emphasis and it's been picked up uh, in 2015. Government interest in STEM education explicitly began in 2015 with the 2015 policy address, and I'll talk about that in my next slide. But in the US, in the United Kingdom, Germany, and Japan, we see a, we can trace back much deeper and longer routes to this emphasis on STEM. For example, in the United States, interest in STEM education began with the Morrill Act in 1862, which established land-grant university, Cornell being one of them from which I graduated. The further impetus came with the Cold War in the 1950s and 1960s with uh, expanded focus on engineering to science. How can we leverage science to promote engineering to help us um, fight the Cold War against Russia? Uh, the a challenge that the U.S. has been seeing over the last few decades is a decline in students in, uh, participating in STEM education and performing well in STEM subjects. In the U.K., um, Anthony's talked about this already, scientific education may have begun as for early as the 11th century with the establishment of the University of Oxford. The modern impetus to promote STEM education uh, came with the Taunton Report of 1868, and as Anthony mentioned, 1930s, the then Prime Minister also was a strong promoter of uh, STEM education. A more recent act, uh, a law was passed in 1988, the Education Reform Act, in which science was made compulsory in primary and secondary schools. So we can see even the United Kingdom, where you can trace the roots back perhaps to the 11th century, a more recent trend and shift to emphasize and accentuate STEM education. In Germany, they have a long an illustrious history with STEM education beginning from the 15th century, the age of the Enlightenment and scientific revolution from the 17th to 19th centuries um, saw an increased uh, focus on science and engineering with institutes of technology such as, uh, uh, sorry, institutes of technology built on the Humboldt model of research and education. And the Humboldt model deserves recognition and a, a few um, words of attention because it is a model that tries to situate science and engineering with a broader societal within a broader societal context. And there was, of course, a revival of STEM education of the Second World War, supported by the United States. 
in Japan, um, which has also be, been alluded to by Anthony, um, since the Meiji Revolution of 1868, there was a huge impetus for incorporating STEM into Japanese education system, uh, modeled after Germany. Additional reform took place after the Second World War, quite similar to Germany, when they borrowed many of the practices from the US. Now, let's bring our attention to Hong Kong, since we are all sitting in Hong Kong, and the topic of today's discussion is can and how STEM education in Hong Kong help to move it into a, in, it become an innovation and technology hub. So I reviewed the last eight years of annual policy addresses from 2015 to the present, and we see that indeed in 2015, with the, uh, when uh, our chief executive was C.Y. Leung, uh, there was a renewed um, attention given to STEM education. And I've listed out on the right-hand side, and you can read this yourself, as to how STEM education was emphasized in the 2015, 2016, 2017 policy addresses of C.Y. Leung, and even thereafter by his successors, Carrie Lam, in 2018, and also in 2020. Uh, the most recent policy address of last October in 2022, uh, we saw um, uh, a remaining emphasis on STEM, but a shift from not just STEM, but the addition of the A into the acronym to become STEAM, and the A stands for the arts. So these bubbles on the right perhaps give you some indication of um, the attention that was accorded to STEM education. As you can see, the bubbles have been gradually increasing in size, which goes to reflect the greater attention accorded, particularly by John Lee, to promote STEM education. And as we all know, um, innovation and technology is a major focus of Hong Kong's pursuit uh, of economic growth these days. And there is a specific focus on attracting innovation and technology talent, many of whom have graduated in STEM subjects from the top 100 universities across the world. So why has there been this shift away from STEM to STEAM? I think I'll pick up here from Anthony's comments um, uh, from the last few slides of his presentation. Insofar as the chief executive and Hong Kong now um, is trying to promote um, an education that is for all, for fun, and for diversity. Because many people felt that STEM was quite specific to those who had a predisposition for mathematics, for engineering, for physics, and so forth. And the addition of the arts is an effort to move away from that um, uh, notion that STEM is only uh, applicable or appropriate and, and um, doable by a certain segment of the population. As we all know, there's always been an underrepresentation of females, for example, in, in the sciences and engineering subjects. So the addition of A is not just to counterbalance that particular um, change, but also to demonstrate that STEM, or STEAM in this case, is not uh, con con consigned to a small segment of the population. It's accessible to everyone. And um, with that, there's been a shift from ju not just science, technology, and math, but to science, engineering with coding, to creative subjects as well. This recognition that creativity can be a key ingredient to promoting education and to promoting innovation and technology. Because we have to understand that even this focus on STEM is a means to an end. What is the end? In Hong Kong's case, the end is to become an innovation and technology hub. So if that is the goal, to become an innovation and technology hub, then surely the arts creativity has a role to play in, in, in the pursuit of that goal. And finally, uh, well, not finally, uh, there's been a growing recognition that experiential learning is becoming very important and education can be had from um, places outside of the classroom. Education should not necessarily be limited to just classrooms. It is possible to be educated in, in the field, in, in workplaces, in, the in, in industries, in, through internships and so forth. And as I mentioned, it's this shift from STEM to STEAM is tied to Hong Kong's ambition to become a major innovation technology hub that has taken up renewed impetus uh, over the last few years. Um, our President Xi Jinping, when he visited Hong Kong on the 1st of July, made a trip to the science park. And that sort of sealed the deal, if you would like, that innovation and technology is going to become a key part of Hong Kong's future. And also, finally, the shift from STEM to STEAM is aligned with mainland China's promotion of popular science education, not just the hard sciences, but also the soft sciences. And with that, I'd like to um, briefly compare uh, STEAM education in Hong Kong and the mainland China. There are some similarities in the first th couple of rows of this table, and there are some differences. The similarity is that both uh, places began to emphasize um, 
STEM or STEAM education with renewed vigor in, the 2015, uh, in 2015, in Hong Kong's case with the 2015 policy address, in uh, mainland China's case with a gov uh, sorry, guiding opinions on comprehensively and deeply promoting educational informationalization during the 13th five-year plan. The fields of focus in Hong Kong are science, technology, mathematics, branching out into the engineering and arts recently, and in mainland China, the fields of focus are quite similar, IT, coding, uh, maker education centered on building hardware. There are some differences between the two. Um, in Hong Kong, students enroll in one or more of the STEM subjects, such as physics, biology, and chemistry, especially uh, in this um, HKDSE framework that they now pursue. In mainland China, students enroll in both arts and science courses in the first year of high school and choose their subjects in their second year. And then a final difference is that the approach towards STEM in Hong Kong is promoting science and engineering mastery, single subject mastery, whereas the approach in mainland China is more towards interdisciplinary education, project based learning and problem solving. And this is a key difference, as I hope that you've been able to discern from Anthony's and my comments so far. So to my last slide. What matters in STEAM or STEM education? In the first slide, I, I showed you a little graphic from the Jockey Club. I think that graphic is quite important because it, it, it captures six principles, um, and it's from the HKU Jockey Club Self-Directed Learning in STEM program. And these six principles are sort of, if you would like, the key ingredients for STEM education. What are these six principles? Self-directed learning, innovation, entrepreneurial spirit, creativity, problem solving skills and collaboration. So note one key point. There's no mention of science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics in these six principles. These principles are macro principles, which align with with what Anthony was especially saying in his last few slides about about being um, good problem solvers who can who can work across um, industries who can who can solve different problem sets so that when they go out into the workplace and find jobs that did not exist when they entered university, they are still nevertheless able to excel in those jobs. And the emphasis in STEM education should not be mainly on memorization, but rather on understanding and application. How do the theories that they're learning in STEM or STEAM, um, how are they relevant and applicable to solve current problems? How those concepts, how those theories are being challenged by emerging technologies such as AI. There's been a big push uh, going to the using the example of chat GPT just to ban it blanket a blanket ban. But some of the more innovative thinkers are saying no integrate it into your into your curriculum. This is AI chat GPT is not going to go away. Tell us how you can use it. How can the scientific breakthroughs of today be emerged into our frameworks and our, our education system of tomorrow. And finally, how can insights from different fields be integrated with one another? That is an emphasis. Um, that is a challenge that also has to be overcome as we move towards um, the promotion of STEAM rather than STEM education. Thank you. Those are my, my comments. OK, thank you very much, Nabuha, for a very focused and also the eloquent discussion. So our last speaker is Professor Lloyd Hylock. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think um, both Anthony and uh, Professor Sharif have already um, presented very systematically um, and also uh, in a very organized manner about some of the issues related to STEM education and its connection with uh, Hong Kong's uh, future in terms of being an uh, innovat innovative and uh, technology hub. Um, I must confess that I, I know very little about um, STEM education and also um, technology itself. Um, so I, 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 I came up with probably a series of questions uh, rather than um, um, answer to, to, the, to the topic. And secondly, I, I, I personally have a background that, um, that make me kind of very skeptical about STEM or even STEAM. Um, right from the very beginning. Um, this is something very, very personal. You know, you don't need to uh, be convinced. Uh, but I mean, for someone like myself, um, I literally failed in all science subjects when I was a teenager, including math as well. I only passed once in my mathematics. Is, that was in the school cert exam. 
And that's why it made me possible to move on to A level and then I get into University of Hong Kong and, and so on. It was kind of the uh, Hong Kong miracle uh, of the 1970s. And my fine arts subject barely get a pass again when I was a teenager. So when you talk about STEM and you try to bring in the A and make it STEAM, won't it be able to save me? I, I, I survived in the public exam system by doing well in um, Chinese history, history, geography, um, and then the two languages, and that's all. Of course, if I do it again, probably I can still get into higher education by just scoring in those subjects. Uh, but somehow, um, I would imagine that, you know, if I, if I were um, a teenager nowadays, and hearing, you know, all these propagandas about STEM and STEAM and so on, I would feel very, very much marginalized. And I think it, 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 it is, well, in a way, it's a bad thing because I don't think it's just about marginalizing me, but it marginalizing about a certain proportion of the student population um, who really um, probably would be more capable of dealing with issues like problem solving, um, creative, not in the sense of, you know, fine arts, but, you know, in the sense of um, 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 raising questions, being critical, and, and, and so on and so forth. And that is the sort of background to the series of questions that I would like to raise. And, and that's why I changed the topic it into, you know, you know, is STEM education really matter? Of course, I, I, I'm, I would again emphasize that, you know, um, it's easy to say, you know, with, with, to all those government initiatives of having STEM education or STEAM education, and simply say yes and, and applaud because um, when you see the government is ready to reform the, the curriculum and, and ready to bring in you know, changes to our pedagogy as well as the uh, structure of the school, I, I think it's, it's good. And of course, if most people would be becoming more innovative, you know, capable of handling coding, et cetera, that, that would be marvelous. Um, Quite simply that, you know, it, it, it's very difficult to say no to education when, you know, this is one of the very important way of, of, of further reform down the road of enhancing people's quality, skills, and as well as, well as orientation towards uh, their own future. Um, and again, it, it's also difficult to say no, uh, because whether you talk about STEM or STEAM, uh, they promise to cultivate creativity, ability of integration, innovation, and so on and so forth. Um, but why I remain a skeptic, I, I explain a little bit about my personal background, but at the same time, um, I, I really think that we, we need to get into critical discussion. Um, Professor Sarif and, and Anthony have already pose some of the issues about some of the um, gaps, some of the missing points, and you know some of the issues that have to be addressed um, to further push forward um, Hong Kong becoming uh, an innovation hub. And so I like to raise further questions, probably not exactly in the same direction, but probably in another areas. Um, I think there are a lot of questions to be addressed in handling, um, nothing about just about STEAM or, or STEM, but about reforming education and also to promote Hong Kong into an innovative and, and, and technology hub. Um, first of all, um, when we change the curriculum, it's it always important for us to bear in mind about issues to be encountered in the front line. Um, Professor Sharif has already mentioned about teaching STEM in silos, um, because if you stick with science, technology, engineering, mathematics, um, should they be kept separate or rather integrated and, and, and so on. And in the local context is quite a lot of times I've heard of people thinking that, you know, okay, then we prepare new teaching materials. Later on you think, okay, we prepare new learning materials. So there will be assignment sheets, so that's students would be asked to fill in the blanks and so that, you know, they would 
be one another way to move forward uh, with all these pre-manufactured uh, teaching and learning materials, then even though the frontline teacher may not be that integrative or that STEM oriented, uh, still students would be able to, to acquire new knowledge. But I must say that, you know, in, in order to really to teach STEM or STEAM, it's actually very demanding because it, it demands a lot about teacher's skill, how to be responsive to students questions in the course of discussing topics, doing experiments, or, or, or working on a, on a robot and, and, and so on. Because theoretically, you suppose students would respond, raise new questions, and then the whole group would engage with the question and try to solve it. And that is, quite honestly, very, very demanding. It's, it's not just about, you know, you have two or three sets of pre-manufactured teaching and learning materials would be able to deal with it. It also requires a lot of knowledge of integration on the teacher side, because it, 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 it always touch on moving from one domain to another, moving from maybe physics into ke to chemistry, mathematics back to arts and, 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 and so on and so forth. And in some cases, I've, I've, I've seen teachers who turn out to be quite successful, you know, to raise historical questions and connect them to issues about engineering, issues about uh, mathematics, so that, you know, a general would be able to win a war because of knowing all this, you know, scientific knowledge and, and, and so on and so forth. But that's very demanding. It is is not just about um, ongoing retraining would, would, would be able to fully to deal with that sort of issues. So we have to bear in mind, you know, how, how are you going to make sure that, you know, that can be done in the front line? The second thing, which is specific to Hong Kong, is that it's quite easy for you to talk about STEM in primary school all the way up to the first semester of primary five. And then when you need to submit the scores for appraisal, then everyone gets very nervous. And then, you know, you need to go back to basic tests, appraisal, assessment, and, and, and so on. Same thing in the secondary level. It's okay for you to talk about STEM and having the entire school to, to play with robots all the way up to maybe Form 4. And then the public exam format comes in and everyone thinks that, you know, you go back to the books, you go back to the original structure and things would be, again, highly structured. Um, of course, you may say that, you know, what we need to do is just to enlighten the students at the early stage. So even after dealing with the highly structured public exam, they would have a new mindset and therefore when they go to university, they would be innovative and creative. Maybe, I don't know. We probably need some research on that. But um, I do think that we need to contextualize in the current school system in order to ensure that you know we are really seriously doing STEM or STEAM. The second thing is well, you know, it's, it's, it's always easy for us to say that, okay, we want to be, become innovation and technology hub, and so we need talents. And one of the ways to move forward, of course, is education. But at the same time, let's, I mean, let, allow me to play the role of a critic. Then I will ask the question, is STEM education or STEAM education a necessary, necessary condition for Hong Kong becoming an innovation and technology hub. I'm not talking about sufficient condition. I'm just saying that, you know, is, is it really a necessary condition? Of course, you probably would say, okay, when we talk about education, don't mention about cost, don't mention about effectiveness, everything. Okay, fine. I'm fine with that. But I'm just saying, okay, let's be honest. Hong Kong is a city. Hong Kong by itself is also a hub. And does a city need local talents? Of course, it's easy for us to say, yes, of course. But then one of the very important features of a city is that people come in and people go. You have flows of people in and out. And so as a result, well, even though that we are not good at STEM education, we are not good at STEAM education, 
they are talents from the mainland. They are also talents, Hong Kong born, but they are educated, trained abroad, and they can come back. And also, don't forget, you know, the flow of talents in the coming decade may take a very different format. I keep imagining that, you know, five years down the road, with all these new technological advancement, would we still need to stop at the um, checkpoint at at the immigration and take several minutes to to cross the border and come in to work or going back home? Um, I think we just walk straight on. You know, it, it it's like it's 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 like basically like 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 traveling on on like commu daily commuting. So with that sort of mobility, then we probably need to think a lot a lot of new questions. Of course, you would probably challenge me by saying, no, 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 no. You we, we, you got to have the locals. But I mean, look at the case of Taiwan. Back into the 90s, when they developed Sinju the science park, a lot of the talents came back from the United States, exactly because there were a lot of Taiwanese students. They study in the US, and then they stay behind, work in the Silicon Valley, and then they became the major forces to drive innovation in Sinju. You may probably say that I don't like this model, you know, I, I don't like this idea at all, but that's a doable alternative. So I'm just raising the question saying, what about if Hong Kong is a hub, Hong Kong is a city, we look at the necessary conditions for Hong Kong becoming an innovation and technology hub in a different perspective. And this of course connected with the cost effectiveness of um, of an education reform strategy. Um, so one way to look at this question is, this is again about education. Don't talk about cost and effectiveness. Yes, fine. But if we're going to come up with a certain amount of investment for a certain period of time, where should we spend it on? Local primary school and secondary schools? Yeah, of course, we, we need better schools. But at the same time, inevitably, we have to deal with the questions that, hey, it takes another 10, 15 years for these kids to become talents and to address our current question of becoming a technology hub. So what are you going to do in, in between? Well, import talents in the short term. But is it a short term strategy or rather a, a longer term strategy? Okay, if I say, don't just confine to local and primary schools, change it, use the same amount of money, turn it into scholarships and send local high school students or, 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 or undergraduate students to go abroad, spend four years there, you got a PhD, you come back, you got an undergraduate degree, you come back and well, you have a new pool of talents within five years, why not? Of course, they would say the scholarships should go to the local universities because that's the way to foot forward. That would be longer term strategy. But sometimes I think that, you know, our, our quest of becoming an innovation and technology hub is probably like playing in the English Premier League or La Liga in Spain or Serie A in Italy. Do you need a lot of local players? Do you need a lot of English players in, in, in English Premier League? Well, you need, yes, fine. But are, are they the most talented player? Probably not. Um, and you can still be the most money earning top English football club in the world without a lot of local players. Of course, none of us would like this idea just relying on the mercenaries, uh, relying on the expatriates and, and, and so on. But we do think that we need to look at, you know, what, what is the real long-term strategy, which personally, of course, I would think we need to invest in local universities. But pitching at which level? Undergraduate level? 
or rather focusing on postgraduate education. Because focusing on postgraduate education, probably you would be able to spread your net and have a bigger and broader source of talent, not only from mainland China, but also from Southeast Asia, other countries, Belt and Road countries, and, and, and so on and so forth. It is not exactly the same ball game when you focus on undergraduate and postgraduate. Where to go to? Which would we pitch at? I think these are questions that are probably worth considering. And lastly, I would like to raise the question that at the end of the day, like what already mentioned by Professor Sharif is, it, and also Anthony as well, it's, at the end of the day, it's, it's the ecosystem that is most important. I don't think that, you know, um, like what Sharif has said, that, you know, just by relying on one ingredient, it got to be the ecosystem as a whole to make it possible. So what exactly is the role of, this, of the government? Not only about whether it's being active or not active enough, but also about the scope and the breadth, the coverage of the role of the government. Because you need to create incentives for local talents and local students to really pick up STEM and STEAM education, to really pick up engineering, science, whatever, as their career. So you need that. Same thing for the role of the business community. What is the role of business community? The kind of job they look for, the kind of people they look for, where do they look for the talents? What are the the, the, the sort of new jobs that they would create and what are the sort of time span that they have. 20 years ago, I, I, I visited a Japanese company near Osaka and, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a company for producing shampoos, conditioners and, and, and so on and so forth. And they have all a, a very big lab with all kinds of innovations of all these daily products. One of the very interesting topics that arise was that, you know, they allow for these people, researchers as well, to work on all kinds of crazy ideas. And many, many years ago, there was, at that time, thought a crazy idea. And that was having a shampoo with air conditioning, hair conditioning effect. So it's shampoo, conditioner for you. At the very beginning, most people laughed at that idea because they said no Japanese, especially young ladies, would have her hair wet, go to the street and take on the subway because that looked very impolite. So that no one need to hurry. So you don't need to put conditioner into shampoo. But at the end, of course, we know a lot of people now spending a lot of money on buying good shampoo with conditioner effect because we all live in a hurry. We all need to dash to go to work. And even for Japanese young ladies, as, as a result of the time constraint, they gave up all these things about their appearance and they need to do it. So that company actually allow for people to come up with 200 crazy ideas with only one of them hit the jackpot and that's innovation. It's a very different kind of practice very different from Hong Kong's usual practice of having profit returns within one or two years, that kind of thing. So you need to again create a new kind of business culture, a new kind of business community in order to make sure to the local talents that you know you would be rewarded, you would have the opportunity, there would be the chances so that there would be enough incentive to pull people into it. And so I think um, government, business community, the general ecosystem, we need to work on it as well. And I do think that you know changes in that side of, of the question would also be very critical for Hong Kong's success in becoming an innovation and technology hub. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dialogue, and actually thank you all of you, you know, for giving us a very good basis for discussion. I learned a great deal, and I think you have offered a lot of ideas for discussions and I hope some of the audience are government officials or politicians or stakeholders in this area. So before we open up the questions, okay, so may I invite the panelists to 
share the response or reflections on each other's ideas, even though I know, you know, uh, Dialogue, for instance, has responded to some of these ideas. So anyone who want to share? Uh, maybe I, I, I'll start. I think um, the three of us, uh, in a way, we all have a, share a sense of uh, skepticism, if you like, about STEM education. Now, not that we disagree with STEM education, but we, we, we need to really uh, determine uh, the, the importance or the uh, implications of whatever we try to do in STEM education. So I could, following on what Dialogue has said, I would like to raise maybe three questions. First, can we have innovation without STEM? Okay. And I think we can. It depends how we define uh, innovation, uh, creativity. Uh, oftentimes in, in uh, delivering talks to, to people, I use the example of one of the great inventions of Hong Kong back in the 1960s, and that was the dim sum trolley in Chinese restaurants. I think it's great, it's very innovative. But you've asked me, I mean, what, how, how much technology is involved? Minimum. It's the rearrangement of doing things. So the question is, how do you define innovation? Can you become an INT? Uh, of course, because you have a T, that, that, that requires a bit of technology. But if you simply talk about that innovative hub, maybe technology is not the only uh, option. I'm, I th I'm not sort of downgrading, denigrating the, the importance of uh, technology, but we should encourage creativity in other domains as well. So question one. Question two, Dialogue said he, f he failed in STEM <laughs> subjects. <laughs> now, now then the question is, what do we do about people who are not good in STEM subjects? Can they be creative and innovative as well? So if, so, if the, there is such a possibility, what kind of ecosystem is necessary? I mean, Hong Kong, back in the 1970s, we are very advanced in terms of, uh, let's say, Hong Kong movies, the movie industry, uh, Canto Pop, and all that contributed to Hong Kong's soft power. Now, maybe at that time, we, are, we were not that, uh, do, doing that much in terms of what is known as STEM uh, education today. Uh, sometimes people who failed in, in those uh, mainstream subjects, actually they became excellent in other aspects. So what matter? What make Hong Kong's soft power uh, grow despite uh, the fact that we sometimes lag behind in traditional STEM areas. So again, how do we define uh, um, in innovation and creativity? The third question is, because I quoted uh, what the uh, a former vice chancellor of Macquarie University said, that sometimes we are so uh, 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 keen on imparting knowledge that uh, we for for forget that we need to impart wisdom. So in terms of wisdom, now, talk about wisdom. Has uh, technology, innovation and technology, things like AI, uh, chess, GPT, and whatnot, would they sometimes constrain wisdom? Because increasingly, human beings rely on these machines, these technological instruments, that their knowledge, their own human knowledge, may become <laughs> underdeveloped. Is there such a risk? And what about the ethics? People you, uh, abusing, uh, misusing INT for ulterior uh, purposes, uh, IT fraud, for example. So I think these are also very important issues if we try to pursue uh, STEM education in a more holistic way. Thank you. 
Thank you, Anthony, for those um, inspiring and thoughtful comments. I absolutely agree with you. And I think we, the three of us, share this idea that it is possible to have innovation without STEM. And in fact, if you look at many of the universities, um, calculation of research output previously used to be confined to patents, uh, licensing, consultancy ar arrangements. And now, as you mentioned this word in your presentation, KT, knowledge transfer, the, the, the shift we've seen in higher education is one where there is a growing recognition that even the business school, architecture, law, all of these disciplines can also contribute to innovation. Business, for example, can contribute to business model innovation. Um, so there is, I think, a growing recognition, and I think that recognition has to be even emphasized further by people like us that you don't need necessarily need to be in, in chemical engineering to be contributing to Hong Kong's innovation ecosystem. Even if you are a sociology major and history major, you can contribute to, to the advancements of Hong Kong's innovation ecosystem. And then linking back to what Tai Lok said, I, I, I loved his skepticism and this, this, this courage to question, is it necessary to build our own talent? Because Hong Kong, as we know, has always been this gateway economy, dynamic, vibrant, connecting greater China to the rest of the world. And we have not and we have never been a place where we have generated our own technology. There is no global brand that is associated with Hong Kong. Maybe the most famous brand that we can think of, HSBC, but many people don't even know what the H stands for, or Cathay Pacific, which is seeing troubled times. But we do not have any global brands like Taiwan does, like Korea does. Nevertheless, we have been enormously successful. We were considered one of the four tiger economies in the same category as Taiwan, Singapore, uh, and, and Korea. We were considered newly industrializing economies. We are per capita GDP is among the highest in the world. Has that been achieved through innovation and technology? Not really, not really. So a lot of the skeptics argue, use this argument to say that we do not need to focus on, on STEM. I think that might be taking it too far, but I love this, 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 this breath of fresh air that Tyler has had the courage to put into place. Let's think carefully. Let's think carefully. Let's evaluate how, how, how possibly we can achieve at the goal, which is to become an innovation and technology hub through different channels. And maybe one of those channels is being a hub for education, not necessarily training our own. Of course, if our own Hong Kong born and bred youngsters would like to pursue science and technology, by all means, those pathways should be available to them. But it doesn't necessarily have to be forced that every youngster must focus on STEM or STEAM, must focus on STEM or STEAM. Give them the freedom to pursue whatever they are best at doing. And that could be canto pop, that could be movies. And unfortunately, this move towards becoming an innovation and technology hub has seen, the co co seen uh, our Hong Kong status as a canto pop hub or a movie arts hub decline, if anything. Now we, we do not have that that, that pride of place that we did in the 1980s as, as being a place where you would see a vibrant art scene, be it movies or, 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 or canto pop. So I'll leave it there and I'll, I'll ask um, Tai Lok to maybe chime in. You want to, Tai Lok, do you want to respond to it or? Well, just want to add one more footnote uh, to, to our exchanges is that um, if we focus on innovation, then probably that would help us to broaden the scope of things that we need to get prepared and, 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 and to work on. Um, because whenever we, we, we try to relate innovation and technology, then I think in the past few years, a lot of people would then be driven towards looking at hardwares, the really very technical part of, of it. Of course, that, that's also involved a lot of innovative ideas and, and, and breakthroughs and, and, and so on and so forth. But if we talk about innovation in a very broad sense of the word, then, yeah, you know, if, if you look back at the Hong Kong movies, one of the very interesting things is that, you know, that there are groups of people who work on those, all those jackets and, and backdrops in, in a movie 
without the proper thing. You know, when you see a car, it's not exactly a car. You know, it's 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 something they made out of it. And these people, I I I know some of them, are so innovative, so imaginative, and that they help Hong Kong movie to be able to produce and become box office with sometimes a low budget. And these are innovation as well. And we need more of that.、Uh, and also, don't forget nowadays. I mean, it, it, it's very easy for someone to say, "Okay, I tape on the idea of someone, maybe from Taiwan, maybe from, you know, Wuhan or Shanghai, and to connect it with another person in Hong Kong or in Tokyo, and then you work on a very, very innovative idea, and then it may come a major breakthrough in 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 that market." And then you win,、um, and a lot of these things about moving from one domain to another, one area to another. That's kind of cross-discipline, cross-domain perspective. Is also a source of innovation, and I think sometimes when we focus too much on STEM in the very narrow sense of the word, that actually, you know, restrict our our, our own imagination. And I think we need to sit sit back and and look at it in a in a broader way. Thank you.、Uh, thank you very much.、Uh, so I really think、uh, I've learned a great deal, and、uh, I cannot but take this advantage to reflect on this as well before I open up to Mr. Anthony Lee. So from、uh, Nabuha, I think the key word that I get is、uh, the ecosystem. But you see that、uh, I'm a public policy scholar, and、uh, a lot of people. In Hong Kong and elsewhere, you know, in and out of government, are talking about. Of course, we need to build an ecosystem. But as you all know, social institutions evolve. So maybe the ecosystem is the evolutionary result of a mix of you know different factors that no single、uh, stakeholder or government can manipulate. <laughs> so, so this is what I think、uh, that intrigues me. From Anthony, I think one thing that、uh, is exceptional and seldom talked these days is critical thinking. Critical thinking is crucial for creativity, for freedom of expression, exploration of ideas, including challenging the premise of STEM education. So, are we doing enough, you know, in fostering、uh, critical thinking all over, so that we have new ideas? I think that is a crucial question for all levels. In education, as we know that there seems to be answers to everything, and we have to teach the students the answers, not to stimulate them to think and find the right answer. From Thailand, I think you know what intrigues me is you you have raised a lot of profound policy questions that sometimes our policymakers don't think about <laughs> before they put the money. You know, because policymakers tend to. Use money to solve problems. They want to see input because they don't have time to see the output. By the time they will be gone,、uh, beyond the tenure. So one thing that intrigues me concerns incentive. You know, so is it because we don't have enough incentive for chicken and egg questions that stimulate the growth of these industries or investment in these areas? So some scholars will think, well, we need to change the political economy, the structure. But really, this is a big question. So, how can we do something, and do some intervention and change and bring about what we see? For instance, I've seen Hong Kong performing excellent in all this grooming of talent in the 70s and 80s, despite all this lack of investment in education. So, where where have all the talents gone? The graduates have gone abroad, and they become stars in science and technology elsewhere. <laughs> Even though they didn't get the investment to do the research in Hong Kong, as we all know, you have Professor Choi Lap Ji, we have numerous, many other Hong Kong scholars just receiving an education, but they, you know,、uh, have explored and then developed the major contributions on,、uh, you know, STEM or whatever. So may I now open the floor? The first question is、uh, Mr. Anthony Lee. Let me read the question out loud. The question is: We are talking about gaps in innovation of STEM or STEAM, but the biggest is the understanding, educating teachers. How will just building this educate enough teachers? So, anyone who wants to respond. 
very good uh, question to raise uh, here. Uh, the, import, the, 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 the real question is, what do you mean by grooming teachers? What kind of teachers do we, do, do we need? In my view, teachers are not just people who sort of transfer knowledge, a knowledge in a narrow or sort of always uh, def, uh, bounded way. Because teachers should serve as the role model. So when students see the teachers encourage imagination, creativity, then they would be more confident and uh, develop their capacity. Uh, oftentimes, uh, uh, which I think may not be entirely correct, but sometimes people say, well, uh, oriental education, sort of rote learning, uh, memorizing, or teachers always, whenever students uh, raise a point, teachers always say, uh, you're right or you're wrong. But then, uh, sometimes in a non sort of uh, oriental or Chinese setting, sometimes people say, well, in Western education, people have more freedom because teachers, when you give the wrong answer, a student gives the wrong answer, teacher must still say, very interesting answer. So, I mean, so I'm not trying to dichotomize the East and West in that sense, but I think uh, there's food for thought. What kind of uh, teaching and learning should we encourage. And uh, Peter, earlier you said that uh, a, a point to be to take away from what I, I, I've presented is critical thinking. And I think critical thinking is not about criticizing. People often equate critical thinking with criticizing. I think critical thinking is, can we ask questions? And are we asking uh, sometimes the right questions or even sometimes the wrong questions because the wrong questions could eventually lead to something that you have never thought about before. So it's a bit like what Dialogues mentioned about this crazy idea in the Japanese factory. Can we allow crazy ideas? Imagination, reimagine. And I think if our education system can provide room for that kind of uh, activity, then we, 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 we are more assured of having the opportunity to develop an innovation. Thank you. Others who want to respond? I'll probably respond very briefly. Um, I do think that we would, would be able to prepare to have enough teachers to facilitate STEM or STEAM education. But at the same time, we need to develop the right mindset and sort of expectations because we are not talking about grooming a lot of PhD graduates and then ask them to go to primary schools and, and secondary schools to teach. Because if you think that, you know, in the primary and secondary schools, we need teachers who are very, very good at physics, chemistry, biology, maths, everything, so that they will be able to teach STEM it won't do. The role is not exactly there. Uh, quite honestly, if you ask me, when I uh, spending seven years in the secondary school, who are the teachers that you know really inspire my interest in in, in history of geography? Well, it's it's those teachers actually talk to us informally in the playground or in one of those school picnics. That guy throw a question or ask me to do certain things and then you got inspired and then you got interested and then you, 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 you push yourself to, to work on it. I think good teachers in secondary and primary schools are, are like this because if you really think that you know we need very, very knowledgeable teachers to do all the kind of things, then of course it's easy for you to say, okay, then ask all these university professors to go to primary school and secondary schools. But then the question is, we all know, at least four of us here know most of the university professors don't know how to teach. <laughs> well, we know how to teach, but not <laughs> teaching in a very stimulating way. Um, so I, I, I do think that we need to, you know, again in Hong Kong, fine tune this because a lot of people in, in Hong Kong like to criticize local school teachers by saying that, you know, oh, your English is not as good as, even as the parents so that you are not allowed to teach English. Your knowledge about STEM is not as good as 
another set of parents. So forget it. You know, you 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 you're being fired. Hey, look. You know, at the end of the day, they are people who are supposed to stimulate the kids, inspire the kids, and if these are the people who are willing to talk to the kids, you know, work on the same robots or experiment with the kids on the playground and and get students interested, even though that guy only scored. A four or even a three in in DSC doesn't really matter because he knows how to teach and inspire. That would be far more important. And what we need to do is to prepare to have enough teachers with that kind of heart and men, and, and, and mindset to play that role. On this, uh, may I add uh, a story? Uh, many years ago, when I was president uh, of this institution, so at that time we tried to promote the. Uh, the importance of education, and uh, we invited uh, well-known figures in the society to to tell us, to share with us their success stories, so to speak. And one story was very fascinating. is from uh, Lo Gun Teng, the, the the songwriter, the singer, and he said he had difficulty to learn. So every time in the class, he failed to sort of fulfill the task assigned to him. And he 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 finds it so difficult to, to 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 deliver proper speech. And he mentioned that uh, his, his experience in uh, a school in in the U.S. And he said that t a particular teacher uh, uh, sort of told him, if you can't say it, sing it, sing it out. So he tried to sing it out, and he discovered here this talent of singing, and that was the beginning. I mean, according to him. So I think a teacher is so important, in the sense that you're able to to stimulate, to inspire, to inspire, sometimes in a non-conventional way. Thank you. Uh, any? Sure, sure, sure. Please. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really inspiring, and I could expand my landscape on the STEM education. Hearing your words starting from the wisdom, the humane aspect of STEM, that was very highlighted by Professor Cheung. I admired that. I, I consider that is a social dimension uh, address to the STEM. Maybe it's quite often we get a question, what is the social aspect in STEM? Is it objective science or a subjective? So you highlighted the subjective aspect. So coming to the another part, like uh, uh, Professor Sarif showed the economic dimensions, like he said, like there is an incentive to watch the STEM, so that would be one of the attractions. So, and then uh, you also came to watch the investment perspective, uh, Professor Locke. For one of the dimensions, what I feel is like uh, missing when we are talking about these different dimensions. When we look at the historical aspect of initiation of STEM, 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 or uh, different type of abbreviations that we have been like stimming or some some even use innovation addition to that uh, when we look at it the origin it comes from some of the countries of west the first policy that is started don't you see some political things like uh, could it be a branding of educations of the west in some way like oh if it's a steam it started from there so steam these places could may have a better STEM education. So in a way, I also see STEM discipline. Although we have been practicing from quite early, we did not brand it as STEM. But it's also a hidden branding aspect there. So how do you see about STEM as in branding in an education? Because education has become a big business now. So STEM itself could be a big brand in terms of economic as well as political and then soft power aspects. So when we talk about the policy, I think we are also looking at whether any of the subjects could brand a country or a place. So do you see any relationship over here? This, this is my things that comes in. Mind. Maybe it is a wild question, as you said it, but I would love to hear it. Thank you. I, I tend to think that inevitably it there's some sort of branding element in in the, in the creation of the idea of STEM or STEAM. Um, partly because it's, you, you need to develop some sort of 
short form acronym to 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 appeal to to other people. But at the same time, I would contextualize it in in the context of increasingly the role of information technology, digitalization, that make a lot of people thinking that you know without engineering or or or, or that sort of skill, you would be very much out of that you know hardware processes um, in, 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 in the search for innovation and, and so on and so forth. Um, so that would be part of it. Um, and also at the same time, of course, the tricky part of branding is that it's, it's always clever for the first mover to do the branding. For others, it's just to follow. The same thing would be ap applicable to the discussions about creative cities. I remember Charles Laundrie once wrote the preface of his own book saying that, you know, um, he threw out the idea of creative cities and then later on he got numerous in invitations from mayors and everyone asking for the formula, the recipe of becoming a creative city. And his joke is saying that, you know, by the time you learn the recipe, the best you can do is to be ranked second in the league of becoming a creative city because you are just following. And if you think Manhattan is the most creative city, by the time you learn all the tricks of being a Manhattan, Manhattan would move forward, so you're always behind. So the idea of following a recipe is guarantee failure because you would never become the first one. Um, I think STEM is also that kind of danger in the sense that you know it is is a clever branding but at the same time if you think by just chasing and replicating everything people have already done and that would help you to move ahead then probably you need to reflect probably this is not exactly the strategy that you're just thinking that you know by mimicking by replicating would be good enough at the end of the day i think every city every country has to go back to, to the very basics. What are the things that you have been good at for the long time? What are the wider contexts that make it possible? What have been changed? And so as a, as a result, is it about adaptation or rather about a major turnaround or whatever it is? And so, of course, I said I fail in all these STEM subjects, but then I do think that, you know, a little bit of history would be important because we always need to look back in order to move forward and, and to look ahead. Very ape comment, Anthony, or? Yeah, I think uh, in, in terms of public policy, in terms of international uh, competition, branding sometimes is unavoidable. Bec and then because human beings uh, or human institutions, we like to move fast, we like to find some quick answers, quick solutions, and mimicking, uh, repeating what, other ha what, what others have done, which is regarded as successful, is quite often a trend. But then if you look back at history, I mean, we are here we are talking about science and education, STEM. Now I mentioned earlier in my presentation that even back in the 1950s, 60s, the world at that time after the war, reconstruction, a uh, 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 brave new world may be forthcoming, and people were saying, okay, we, we should embrace scientific revolution. That will be the answer. The world will be so different. Now, looking back, now we are several decades afterwards, scientific revolution. Now, the long, people, this is not the, the buzzword now. Now the buzzword is innovation technology. But what scientific revolution has promised I think has not been fully delivered. I wouldn't say that it has failed, but it has promised a world that would be more peaceful, more advanced, everybody sharing uh, the, the fruits of scientific revolution, no poverty and no uh, less inequality. But in a way, inequality, conflicts has, has not disappeared. Now, nowadays, when we talk about uh, innovation and technology hub, now, the word itself is, seems to be rather magical. I mean, nobody would dispute uh, the word. But if we try to tease out what we mean by innovation and technology hub, what can it do to improve the well-being 
of our community, of our society. I'm not just, a, I'm not just uh, talking about the overall economic growth, GDP, but people on the street, uh, in the case of Hong Kong, people li living in subdivided units, Tong Fong, <laughs> what can uh, INT Hub promise them? Now, I'm not saying that we, 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 we have to be so cynical about innovation and technology. I'm simply saying that we need to go beyond the current uh, scope of the discourse, because often the discourse has not addressed those issues which need to be addressed. Yeah, I agree with the previous two speakers insofar as STEM could be a branding issue, absolutely. Um, but I think it serves as a focusing device. It allows you to focus on those areas that are important. But then I completely agree with Professor Loy that we should have the courage to determine, is that important for us? How can we customize it? Should it be STEM or should it be STEAM? Because even if it is a branding mechanism by countries in the West, there is no imposition on countries that didn't come up with it to use it. We can think critically, as we've talked about critical thinking, as to to what extent is it relevant and applicable to our situation? How can we make it so that it is more relevant and applicable? So in the case of Hong Kong, we've already discussed, Hong Kong is not a center for innovation and technology. We don't have manufacturing. We don't come up with, with new technologies like computers or phones or cars. How, how, how is STEM or STEAM relevant for us? And maybe what is needed as we go through this process of critical thinking is to say, look, we're adaptable, we're opportunistic, we're quick followers, we're quick imitators. These are the characteristics that have led our small businesses in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s to be successful. Let's try and figure out how can we build on those characteristics that Hong Kong people are really good at. Because if you look at Hong Kong's miracle is indeed a miracle. Without any substantial manufacturing, we have become a first world city over the last five decades. Unlike Singapore, which had multinational manufacturing, unlike Korea, which had its own manufacturing, unlike Taiwan. So maybe this STEM branding thing is a point in time for us to reflect, is it relevant for us? How is it relevant for us? And this matches back to the idea of critical thinking, not just to be, not to just to criticize for the sake of criticism, but to think carefully about how it's relevant and applicable to our situation. I think these are profoundly important and relevant reflections. Uh, I, I agree entirely with what has been said, uh, in part uh, some experience with that. You know, I remember having supervised a student paper uh, on the first round of introduction of STEM, ex STEM education in Hong Kong, and one of them was a teacher, and of course that was basically everything top down, <laughs> and they were not prepared. And then it seems that a lot of these uh, policies, not just STEM, but many other policies were similar in that manner. So the government just wanted to be showing that it's doing something and they're allocating money. Uh, well, there are many other examples, you know, uh, that you know that we don't need to talk about today. So I would say a number of key themes stood out, you know, from our discussion. First of all, it seems that uh, it's not just about STEM education, but about education per se. You know, how are we going to reform or redesign or you know we engineer our education system so that it would sustain creativity you know and critical thinking and innovation in the longer run for our uh, younger generation whether we want to become <laughs> an innovation and technology hub or not i think it's a key question secondly what are the roles of different stakeholders you know as uh, tyler has pointed out the role of the business community schools maybe the government, you know. So maybe they should not just be pouring in money. They should be creating other conditions that would be conducive for all this. And thirdly, of course, it poses a, a lot of questions for universities as well. You know, I think, you know, how should we be positioning ourselves? But as we all know, uh, there seems to be a trend, I don't know whether it's correct, that almost all the universities, yes, are moving toward becoming science, uh, technology or innovation driven universities with emphasis on hard sciences, AI, big data. Um, well, we're not necessarily to the disregard of other, other disciplines, but emphasis is on those disciplines. You look at the buildings, the investments, the hiring of senior 
chair professor seems to be pointing to that direction as well. So I don't know what does that mean for us. Any questions from the floor or from the panelists? You know, any questions from the audience? Well, yeah. Thank you so much to the professor for sharing. It is very rewarding. And I have a question to ask. Um, uh, so in terms of the teacher, teacher pool, does the Hong Kong government need to introduce policy to train current STEM teachers? So, uh, you know, uh, nowadays in Hong Kong, maybe uh, some biology or chemistry teacher not so familiar to the uh, technology or the gramming or coding, they don't know the um, maybe the pedagogy how to teach students. So, um, is there any policy to train the current STEM teachers? Well, um, the um, education bureau actually have um, been working with you know, local universities, including Education University of Hong Kong, um, to develop what we call PDPs. This is the professional development programs for current teachers in um, the school sector. And they can develop new, the so-called PDPs uh, to address uh, the pedagogies for STEM education or um, all kinds of um, new training or retraining we need. So in this regard, I don't think that we are short of resources. We are not having that sort of arrangement. Uh, but again, um, it is important to go back to this front line and to identify really hurdles or obstacles for the effectiveness to making you know this sort of training effective. Because I have taught PDP. But quite honestly, I, I know that theoretically the teachers should be exempted from their school duties and focus here for six weeks or even 12 weeks and to get trained. Uh, but a lot of schools, of course, will still require them to go back because, um, you know, the uh, DSE results are going to be released. You have been cl class masters, so you need to work on something, that kind of thing. So they get distracted and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, of course, this may be just special cases, but still, uh, we need to know about what are the hurdles at the front line to make sure that you know the money we, we invested would be effectively used so that we can address um, the question that you just raised about whether we have enough teachers, whether they would have the new skills, whether they have the chance, not necessarily of, 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 of really a lot of training, but talk to fellow teachers talk to some of the professors about what are the possible ways to to integrate like biology and coding that kind of thing then that would help when they go back to school that would be marvelous yeah can i just add to that i first of all i agree that um, teachers do require retraining so imagine yourself graduating with your bachelor's degree at the age of 24 or 23 or 25 you've been teaching for 20 years and by the time you turn 45 obviously Things have changed and you need to reskill and retool. And I think the PDPs occur even more frequently, not after 20 years. So to answer your question, yes, teachers do require retraining on a continuous and regular basis so that they can keep up with the latest trends in their, in their subject area that they are teaching. But I think at a different level, I'd like to tackle this question at a different level. I think teachers, and I'd like to connect it with what has been discussed earlier, teachers need to have domain knowledge and they have to have the humanity. So teaching is both a science and an art. Teaching requires a somewhat of a different kind of personality, if you would like. Someone who has the heart to impart knowledge, to cultivate knowledge, to, to challenge the students in a, in a positive way. And if you find the right kind of individuals to be teachers, I believe that those individuals will themselves retool and retrain because they know that they're getting out of date after seven years from graduation date. And they need to think about ways to, to, to maintain their skill level. So it goes back to the earlier discussion where, where teaching is both a science and an art. And if you find the right kind of individuals to be your teachers in society, of course, it's, you can't find 100%, but if the majority can be these kinds of 
people who, who challenge you on picnics uh, outside of the classroom in informal ways, in addition to in-class formal pedagogy um, and, and so forth. And then we stand a greater chance of success for, for cultivating our youth, I believe. At that, um, in, you know, on top of what uh, the, the, uh, my, my fellow speakers have said, I think at the end of the day, what do we expect from a teacher? And I think uh, in relation to STEM, for example, uh, there could be, STEM could be regarded as very specific sort of subject domain or matter. So it has its own inherent system of knowledge that you have to acquire before you can teach well. That's one way of, lo uh, of looking at it. But at the same time, sometimes I wonder whether st uh, STEM, I mean, that kind of subject matter, could also be uh, regarded as uh, somewhat generic to the extent that actually every teacher should know about the broad uh, uh, knowledge of STEM. I mean, so in other words, why do we, why should our young children be educated in STEM? Of what uh, Naba has said uh, in, the, in the UK or in other countries, starting from in the UK, you have this policy of uh, science being compulsory in primary and secondary education. So in other words, you think that the world is changing, that these are essential skills, knowledge that you must have, so you should be well immersed in such knowledge and therefore STEM is necessary. Whether eventually you pass the examination is a different matter. We need to be exposed. Now, I've, I could remember more than a decade ago when Hong Kong first introduced liberal studies. Of course, liberal studies now is no longer a subject. I debated with my colleagues in this institution because at that time some colleagues said well government has introduced liberal studies therefore we should have a special be in liberal studies now eventually there was such a program but then I, I i said well should all teachers be good in liberal studies so that every teacher can teach in liberal studies not just teachers trained in the liberal studies be program now, so that's the difference between generic and specific. And I think perhaps uh, we, we should reflect more on what kind of teachers uh, should we be grooming. Well, it seems to me that, uh, you know, my primary education, I don't know how many years ago, but it seems to me that for at least some of the lower forms, for the primary education, the same teacher teach all the different subjects together. I mean, there's no specialization until a certain form, you know. so. But I don't know whether it fit into this STEM discourse, but it seems to me that they teach science and other, you know, uh, lower level subjects, uh, you know, primary level subjects together, you know. So they don't have a division of labor of being a science teacher, a language teacher, but the same teacher teacher. I don't know whether it's still true today. <laughs> Yeah, let me bring in a politically inconvenient uh, subject, and that is the KPI, you know, for the teachers. <laughs> Unfortunately, the KPIs <laughs> would be the scores of the students, and maybe for the KPI of the policymakers, they want investment and output, or not, you know. So any more questions from the floor and from the audience who are on Zoom? So no, any other comments? Yes, this question, please. Okay, uh, before I start, I would like to apologize for my uh, not very ideal state today. But anyway, uh, I do have to appreciate the talk. I did still gain a lot from it. And I do have a couple of questions regarding just uh, STEM teachers or just about the situation in general. Uh, so I'll put my question in two parts. The first part is how I would like to uh, know more about how you see the role 
of STEM teachers in society, because I mean, I, th I think STEM teachers it's it's a very interesting or STEM or STEAM I guess uh, both in both senses uh, these teachers are I think they're in a really special position because like they don't have to be just limited in one place. So to my knowledge, like in maybe in some schools, for example, they have specific teachers that are, I mean, they're different from, for example, teachers who just teach uh, physics, chemistry, biology. They, they're maybe dedicated teachers who just uh, teach um, STEM or STEAM in general as a subject, or they're also um, exterior, uh, extracurricular STEM teachers. For example, my uh, I have first secondhand experience from my younger brother, who takes uh, STEM courses through an online school. So my first question is: I would like to just get more of an understanding about what you think uh, the stand the position or the role, uh, how STEM teachers uh, are able to, I guess, fit in like society right now. That's my first question. And then my second question is related to um, whether there are any challenges uh, STEM teachers have to overcome in this, especially given this current education system. Because I think for me, I'm particularly interested in how STEM in general fits within the Hong Kong education system, especially, for example, in DSC. And to, in, in my opinion, at least, I think Currently, the DSC system is, I think it still has room for improvement for me because the DSC system to me is uh, very broad, but I think it lacks depth. And also it's very grade oriented, which I think uh, it's a little bit contradictory to what STEM is about. So I would like to ask, my second question would be how, if there are any specific challenges that STEM education would face, uh, in the Hong Kong education system. Thank you. I would just say that, you know, in response to the second question is, I, I don't think that there's only one, one tiny button in the system that you, if you click it and then you, you would be able to tackle everything. Um, so inevitably, the, the DSE have its own structure, has its own system, and different schools, of course, have different strategies to work with the different students to cope with, you know, this sort of public exam requirements and et cetera, et cetera. So what we have done, um, because I was a member of the uh, curriculum, I forgot the exact title, the curriculum reform um, task force. Uh, formed by the uh, former chief executive. Um, that's why we, we improved the system of university recommendations of students, not necessarily having the highest score, but simply because they have certain kind of talent, we would recommend them to get admitted into local universities. So if you really stand out in terms of maybe, you know, a, a student winning several competitions in, in, in Form 4, Form 5, before Form 6, doing the DSC. Uh, his talents have already been recognized, and, and that would be a basis for being recommended to enter local universities, maybe even top programs related to STEAM or STEM. Um, so, so you need to loosen different buttons and, and open different kind of opportunities uh, because uh, education at the end of the day, we have to recognize um, multiple pathways. Not every student, talented, not so talented, would fit into one mode of learning and performing. I think one of the major weakness of the existing and, and the old system in Hong Kong is that we always expect students to move in your, into your spectrum and then they perform well and then they would be all right. If they perform well, but outside of your radar, then they're nothing. And we gradually improve this part and that part to cope with you know, the questions you raised on the second part of the question. I don't know whether I'm able to answer questions, but I think it's useful to distinguish between education and education system. 
because as a system, for example, examination, DSZ. Now for all um, uh, sort of systems, you, you need to have some common rules, uniformity in terms of assessment, for example, in terms of subject matter, the curriculum, and um, the, the system provides the framework, uh, directions, but at the same time, the system also constrains because it set boundaries. And teachers in schools, because you are in a formal system, unavoidably, you have to learn to, to, to operate within the system. And the system imposes uh, tasks, expectations, KPIs, if you like. But at the same time, uh, I think for a teacher, when the teacher interacts with individual students, because individual students are so different, and a conscious teacher would like to do more to, to enable that uh, student to mature, to, to develop, develop in a broad sense, not just acquire the, the knowledge stipulated in the, in the official curriculum, but also wisdom in everyday life, how, how to cope with life, how to uh, develop relationships with others. And many of these things are beyond the curriculum. So I think, uh, in fact, uh, the burden or the, the, the mission for a school teacher is quite heavy. I mean, you need to work within the system, you need to do well in examinations, because that seems to be the indicator of your performance, uh, your impact on students. But at the same time, you're thinking of the student as a, 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 a human individual who eventually will enter life. I mean, we're talking about uh, uh, a person, uh, human development, whole person development. So I think for a teacher, uh, the, the teacher has to bear in mind that apart from what should be learned in the curriculum, the teacher should also inculcate in part uh, the kind of uh, living knowledge or wisdom. So, so I don't know whether that will relate to your first question about what uh, uh, STEM means in, uh, in relation to society. So STEM certainly, if we look at it in a broader sense, a more generic sense, uh, uh, is no more than those essential uh, knowledge about, I mean, in engineering, we all know that our society needs construction, uh, building of bridges in order to facilitate a movement. So these are essential knowledge that we need to know, physics <laughs> in terms of engineering. So I think if we try to look at STEM at that level, then maybe, yes, I think every teacher should, should be STEM conscious. But of course, uh, most of the time when we talk about STEM, the, the usual policy or public discourse, we are more confined, which sometimes uh, overlooks other things. Sure. Yeah, maybe my, my, my last word would be on a comment that uh, was made by the, our panelists and uh, Professor uh, Peter earlier. It's about this, the ecosystem being an evolutionary result of a, of a co combination of factors. And I think here it's important to note that history does matter because it is evolutionary. And this links to Professor Loy's comment that there is no button to press. There is no recipe for success. Your analogy of cities, that when you want to become a creative city or a smart city, how do you do it? There is no magic ingredient that, or a rule book that you can just refer to and find, oh, these are the 16 steps. I just put in place the 16 steps. If it were that easy, we would find innovation and technology hubs across the world over after the success of Silicon Valley. But as we know, it's not, it's not as easy as that. One of the main reasons why is because it's an evolution, evolutionary result of many factors combining with each other, and history does have an impact on the state of any given innovation ecosystem. And furthermore, because it's an innovation ecosystem, there are many different ingredients that combine with one another. Well, just a quick, quick word. Um, I think if we have time, we, we should go back to both Anthony's and, and, and Abaha's uh, idea about the ecosystem. And, and I would encourage you know, future discussion to also look at the broader culture. Because 
uh, on one side, Hong Kong now aspires to be innovative and, and, and high tech and, and so on and so forth. On the other side, we have to recognize that, you know, we also have a culture that is pretty good at killing innovation, <laughs> suppressing new ideas. Uh, one example would be that, you know, of course, the government has pumped in a lot of money into the uh, RGC and then through RGC, we got GRF research grants and so on, which are, of course, very good and good resources as well. But at the same time, we all understand that as a university professor, once you turn the research grant into some sort of human resources assessment, whether you got renew your contract or not by the number of grants that you get, then everyone would become very conservative because you need the number of grants in order to survive, not so much of having a grant of major breakthrough. So you, you, you refrain from having major breakthroughs. And these are the sort of, you know, if you look back at Hong Kong's history, that we have this mentality of operationalization that we turn everything into something very simple. And you, 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 you turn it into something operational, but at the end, it actually kills innovation and kills new ideas, which is very unfortunate. But the two sides of this ecosystem, I think, would be probably a topic for next year. <laughs> Well, so thank you very much. I think I like that. So perhaps next time how to promote Hong Kong into a creative city, you know, <laughs> without killing it with policies. So thank you all very much. I have to thank uh, all the three panelists for excellent discussion and also wonderful questions from the floor. So have a very good end. We look forward to seeing you next, uh, next academic year, I hope. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. <laughs>